Okay, juniors, we are going to close out the uh, well the calendar year and second uh, second quarter, first semester, with a reference to our fourth big uh, you know American master here, and this is going to be Walt Whitman. Now we discussed that I'm not the biggest Emily Dickinson fan, although she's talented. Uh, she's got a lot of stuff she does well, but you know Whitman, on the other hand, wrote to be published. His stuff is polished. And I think it has a lot to say. That being said, Whitman ushers in a type of writing I'm not a fan of, and that is the use of blank and free verse. Um, and your book mentions these on 424, at least free verse anyway. It says free verse, unlike formal verse, which has strict rules. Free verse has irregular meter and line length and sounds like natural speech, which to me makes it not really poetry. Um, you know, and I know that's a controversial topic, especially for English teachers. Remember, my degree is in English. It's not in education. So, And most of my work, that I did was within poetry. And when I initially started, I thought free and blank verse represented the peak of the of the craft. I definitely didn't as I got into it more and more. It just, you know, Whitman's good at it, but a lot of people that use this are just not very good, okay? So here's what we're gonna look at uh, today. We're not gonna read the part about the preface to Leaves of Grass. There's some important stuff in that, I suppose, but because we are you know, up against the time limit here, and I'm already a day behind, we're just gonna go past that. We're gonna jump straight into Song of Myself. Now, we do not have the entire poem here. The actual poem is quite large. The actual, let's see, I had Leaves of Grass, there it is. Sorry. All right, so the actual poem song that uh, is, you know, leaves of grass. Now, this is two versions of it in this book, which you can tell, pretty massive, right? It's got the first and then the last versions, which he edited it constantly. And Song of Myself is actually quite large. So we're going to get sections of it, okay? You know, we got the first one, and then you got numbers that indicate the order they show up in it, okay? So let's look at these and kind of talk through them a little bit, okay? All right, it says, I celebrate myself and sing myself. And what I assume you shall assume, for every atom belonging to me as good belongs to you. I loaf and invite my soul, I lean and loaf at my ease, observing a spear of summer grass. My tongue, every atom of my blood, formed from this soil, this air, born here, of parents born here from parents the same, and their parents the same. I now, 37 years old, in perfect health begin, hoping to cease not till death. Creeds and schools are in abeyance. Retiring back a while sufficed at what they are, but never forgotten. I harbor for good or bad. I permit to speak at every hazard, nature without check, with original energy. So that first section is kind of like his intro, talking about what he's going to be discussing at this point, which is, you know, himself, but also the unity of humankind. All right. There's this whole idea of, uh, he says, every atom belonging to me as good belongs to you. And he's talking about the world around us. And just this unity. There's a lot of that in Whitman's writing that, you know, uh, we're a lot more uh, kin than we might want to believe, okay? Which I li do like about his writing. Like, for somebody who doesn't like free verse, I really do appreciate Whitman. I like him better than Emily Dickinson, for sure, all right? Um, he talks about, like, when he says, My tongue, every atom of blood formed from this soil, this air, born here, parents born here, from parents the same, and their parents the same. You see this continuing loop and this link that we're, again, not... You know, there's this idea of romanticism and even transcendentalism where the individual is special and powerful. And Whitman seems to be <clears throat> suggesting, not that they're not, but that, you know, he's leaning more on the humans in general than he is on the individuals. Although this song is called, ironically, Song of Myself, which does, he is praising elements of himself. But then he's also realizing that these elements are, are part of all of us, okay? <laughs> Let's look at the sixth one. A child said, what is the grass? Fetching it to me with full hands, how could I answer the child? I do not know what it is any more than he. I guess it must be the flag of my disposition out of hopeful green stuff woven. Or I guess it is the handkerchief of the Lord, a scented gift and remembrancer designedly dropped, bearing the owner's name some way in the corners that we may see and remark and say whose. And what do you think has become of the young and old men? And what do you think has become of the women and children? They are alive and well somewhere. The smallest sprout shows there really is no death. And if ever there was, it led forward life and does not wait at the end to arrest it. And ceases the moment life appeared. All goes onward and outward. Nothing collapses. And to die is different from what anyone supposed and luckier. Okay. So this part, again, kind of, you know, it's only a few sections away from our intro. But again, we start to see the cyclical nature of how he's pointing out at least in his opinion, 
that nothing ever truly dies. It's just reborn as something else. You know, grass. You know, you come by it with your lawnmower, you cut it down, and then it, uh, you know, if it's like my yard, five minutes later, it's right back. So he has that image. He also applies that to people. And he talks also about death. Um, which is a really interesting statement when he says that life goes onward and onward, nothing collapses, and then he also says that die is, death is not what we think it is. In fact, it's luckier than anything we've ever imagined, which that's an interesting statement. If he was writing me an essay, I'd say elaborate on that, though, because I'd like to know more. Now, sadly, I never have read the entirety of Leaves of Grass, and I certainly don't remember every bit of it. So I don't know if the next stanza or two discuss that, or the next section or two discuss it. But I do know we come into section nine next. The big doors of the country barn stand open and ready. The dried grass of the harvest time loads the slow-drawn wagon. The clear light plays on the brown, gray, and green inner, in, inner tinged. It's a weird word. The armfuls are packed to the sagging mo. I am there. I help. I came stretched atop of the load. I felt its soft jolts. One leg reclined on the other. I jump from crossbeam and seize the clover in Timothy and roll head over heels and tangle my hair full of wisps. Okay, so here's one of those Whitman passages that I'm like, it's pretty imagery. That's about all I got. Um, you know, he's got this image of helping with a harvest. I apologize, guys. It is hot in this room. It's cold outside. Um, this nonsense with this temperature is just going to drive me nuts today. All right. Um, so you got this image of him just kind of doing day-to-day -day chores but enjoying them, which, you know, that's something I guess that we can take as a message there. All right, section 14. The wild gander leads his flock through the cool night. Ye ya Hank, he says, and sounds it down to me like an invitation. The pert may sound it meaningless, but I listen close, find its purpose and place up there toward the wintry sky. The sharp-hoofed moose on the north, the cat on the house sill, the chickadee, the prairie dog, the litter of grunting sow as they tug at her teats, the brood of the turkey hen and she with her half-spread wings. I see in them and myself the same old law. The press of my foot to the earth springs a hundred affections. They scorn the best I can do to relate them. I am enamored of growing outdoors, of men that live among cattle or taste of the ocean or woods, of the builders and stealers of ships and the wielders of axes and mauls and the drivers of horses. I can eat and sleep with them week in and week out. What is commonest, cheapest, nearest, easiest is me. Me going in for my chances, spending for vast returns, adorning myself to bestow myself on the first that will take me, not asking the sky to come down to my goodwill, scattering it freely forever. So, you know, just heads up here, as we're going through this, a lot of these are first impression poems for me, or sections for me, and I do that on purpose because, you know, I want you guys to, to kind of have a model of how to go about reading stuff on a first read. <laughs> You know, really, your first time through a section should be about what's actually happening here. And it sounds like he's, you know, praising nature very heavily here. I mean, he really likes nature a lot, which is common for these writers, remember. And uh, he even kind of plays, from what I'm getting, that last little stanza we read is downplaying himself. So, again, remember, when we see Thoreau, excuse me, and Emerson, there was a big uh, emphasis on the individual. And in Whitman, at least here, we see a little bit less of that. Again, it's not that he feels like humanity has no value, or I'm sorry, individuals have no value, but he seems to see the bigger picture as a, a more telling, all right? Um, I like that we're going to get a little bit of preview here when he talks about on the top of 430, when he says, I'm enamored of growing outdoors of men that live among cattle and so on. Um, that part really speaks to something we're going to read later because he has a special affinity for working class people. He really, really, um, you know, seems to, in his poetry, gravitate towards them very heavily, which I think is cool. Those people don't get enough, especially in poetry before. You had all the, you know, poetry about, you know, fancy upper class people, and you, did, you didn't get as much about the everyday man. And it's nice to see them getting, especially since we're looking at the building of America in this time period, and that's who built America. You know, we can lie to ourselves and say that the Rockefellers and those types of folks are the ones who built America, but they're the ones who bankrolled the building of America. So they do, they do matter, but, you know, in all honesty, they didn't do the work. So, um, so Whitman seems to really, you know, push towards these people. All right, section 17. It says, these are, sorry, let me back up. These are really the thoughts of men in all ages and lands. They are not original with me. If they are not yours as much as mine, they are nothing or near to nothing. If they are not the riddle and the untying of the riddle, they are nothing. If they are not just as close as they are distant, they are nothing. This is the grass that grows between the land, sorry, wherever the land is and the water is. This is the common air that bathes the globe. 
Now, this one, again, is one, like you know, I said, the first read should be what literally is going on. And here, it, it's, um, it just seems like he's trying to show this universality between you know the way he feels and the way everyone else feels. He uses anaphora, which is probably a new term for you. Miss Greeno is kind enough to write it in here, but you know we might just call it repetition uh, today, or even you know not parallelism, but definitely repetitions. They are not. They are not. They are not. They are not. Then the this is and this is. But technically, that's called anaphora. All right, uh, A N A P H O R A. So. Um, very short passage, but again, powerful in that, again, uh, Whitman's trying to, throughout these sections, indicate, you know, the link between man, man to man and also man to nature. So, um, you know, useful stuff, stuff that today we seem to have lost track of, sadly, and the importance of realizing there's kinship between us and between the world around us. And it's not just about me personally and what I want and what I feel like. Man, I wish people today could get that. All right. Well, then we got two sections here at the end, 51 and 52, and they're the only two consecutive ones we get in this little excerpt we were given in our book. It says, The past and present wilt, I have filled them, emptied them, and pr proceed to fill my next fold of the future. Listener up there, what have you to confide in me? Look at my face while I snuff the sidle of evening. Talk honestly, no one else hears you, and I say only, stay only a minute longer. Do I contradict myself? Very well, then I contradict myself. I am large, I contain multitudes. I'd concentrate toward that or them that are nigh. I wait on the door slab. Who has done his day's work? Who will soonest be through with his supper? Who wishes to walk with me? Will you speak with me before I'm gone? Will you prove already too late? Okay. Now, I remember from being a, you know, a kid when I was a junior re reading this part. Because I remember that. Do I contradict myself very well? Then I contradict myself. I am large. I contain multitudes. I remember that sticking out. This section here obviously is leaning towards some concept of death, which I would imagine this is near the end of the poem. So we do get this idea about he's not staying much longer, and the idea of sharing you know, your own personal thoughts with him. It's actually like he's asking for interaction from the reader. Um, the part about contradiction I think is really powerful. It's the idea about, you know, we, we feel like, you know, or at least people today definitely feel like, you know, if I say one thing and then I go back on it later, then that makes me, you know, not intelligent or wrong or I'm lying to myself, and it's not. The fact is, is that <clears throat> he says, I contain multitudes. We contain multitudes. You know, one day I feel a certain way about something. The next I might feel completely different. And that's not a bad thing, guys. That's the sign of an active brain. If you believe one way and no matter what can't change your mind or re-examine your beliefs in light of new information, well, that's a problem. Now, this isn't discussed in talking about faith, okay? I'm not trying to say that you should ever you know, que well, questioning is, is one thing. I'm, not, I'm saying don't ever like, you know, you don't have to change your opinions every time you get a new one. Sorry, voice going out. <clears throat> you know, I had a friend in college who was a Buddhist one day and then a Christian the next, and then he was, you know, flirting with atheism next, but then he decided he wanted to be <clears throat> some other weird Eastern mysticism. That's not what I'm talking about, okay? Changing perspective is really about, okay, well, maybe this element of this is something I need to re-examine. It doesn't mean completely throw out your belief systems every time someone, you know, gives you a decent argument for another one. And that's not what we're saying here. We're saying that, you know, on a day-to-day -day basis, you know, we feel differently about things. And that's okay because we contain multitudes. You know, our emotions and our experiences alter those things. And Whitman noticed that. I mean, really, this poem, all in all, is about, you know, going through life. And, you know, we I mean, when I was young, I had a certain set of beliefs that, you know, I thought I was rigid on. And then, you know, as I grew up and I had to pay bills and I had to get a job and I had to start taking care of myself, I started to alter some of those beliefs. And, you know, some of them have fluctuated. And there's some days where I feel really strongly about a topic that later I may not. So, um, you know, that's just that's just normal. And, and Whitman's saying, so what? <laughs> All right, then last one we've got, 52. He says, The spotted hawk swoops by and accuses me. He complains of my gab and my loitering. I, too, am not a bit tamed. I, too, am untranslatable. I sound my barbaric yawp over the roofs of the world. By the way, that is a very famous line. We'll come back to it. This is the last scud of day holds back for me. It flings my likeness after the rest and true as any on the shadowed wilds. It coaxes me the va to the vapor in the dusk. I depart as air. I shake my white locks at the runaway sun. I effuse my flesh in eddies and drift in lacy jags. I bequeath myself to the dirt to grow from the grass I love. If you want me again, look for me under your boot soles. You will hardly know who I am or what I mean, but I shall be good health to you nevertheless, and filter and fiber your blood. Failing to fetch me at first, keep encouraged. Missing me in one place, search another. I stop somewhere waiting for you. 
again, this one was one that had impact on me growing up. I remember that last little part. Um, <clears throat> the idea that we never truly die, that we're always still there. Um, again, there's, there's, you know, religiously that's problematic, obviously, but um, I think this is more about metaphorically than it is like literally you're still part of the earth, although I guess literally your body is. But, um, you know, again, Whitman's making this point that nothing truly ever dies, that we're still there, and if you look for it, you can find it. That I sound my barbaric yawp over the rooftops of, or the roofs of the world is, is terrific. It's this idea of, of triumph at the end, not fear, not hiding, um, of, you know, surrendering fully, but, you know, accepting your situation and not accepting it with resignation, but accepting it with ardor and excitement, which is really a, a cool statement, okay? So now there's a little brief passages about who Whitman is. Um, notice the strong differences from Dickinson. I mean, this, this guy's a totally different writer, right? So let's do, let's look at another poem of his while we're in this video. I may, let me see what I got here. I may, no, I'm not going to split them. We can do all these in one. We're at ugh, 15 minutes. Let's do one more. I'll break them into two. All right, sorry, you should, you'd think I'd come into this with a plan, but I never do. So let's read my favorite Whitman poem, actually. Um, I teach this a lot in my classes. I love this one. Um, it represents everything about his poetry I don't like, but that I also love. You know, I have a really conflicted, you know, I'm full of multitudes when it comes to Whitman, to be honest with you. So this one's on page 432. It's called When I Heard the Learned Astronomer. It's a very famous poem, and it's a kind of cool. Remember, now this is a lyrical poem. Lyrical poetry is trying to really convey one main idea, and that's what this is going to do, okay? So be prepared for that as we get into it. It says, when I heard the learned astronomer, when the proofs, the figures were ranged in columns before me, when I was shown the charts and diagrams to add, divide, and measure them, when I, sitting, heard the astronomer where he lectured with much applause in the lecture room, how soon unaccountable I became tired and sick, till rising and gliding out I wandered off by myself in the mythical moist night air, and from time to time looked up in perfect silence at the stars. Now, a first read of that, you know, we, we have kind of a story. He's sitting there listening to an astronomer who's very smart, talking about char star charts and talking about measuring things. And we got a lot of very scientific terms here. We got charts, diagrams, add, divide, measure. Um, you know, all of these types of things are all indicating the uh, the science of something. But Whitman is a lot like Mr. Morris in that I'm just not interested in that stuff. I mean, science is great. Uh, I don't really find a lot of interest in it, though. You know, how things work is cool, I guess. But at the end of the day, gravity's gravity. Uh, I don't care how it works. All right. I'm just glad it does. So Whitman feels that same. It's like he gets bored listening to all this and he walks outside and he just enjoys looking at the stars, you know. And the thing about this is, is you can get that basic meaning. That's that's literally what happens. So what's the figurative nature of this? What is Whitman actually suggesting and what he seems to be suggesting to me is sometimes it's great to enjoy just the beauty of things for the beauty of them and not have to know all the pieces i mean this is a great lesson for english teachers and for teachers in general you know sometimes especially with poetry it's fun just to enjoy it you know or, or you know if you're teaching a music class and you know some guy says well i really like rap music or i really like country music or i really like rock, whatever whatever your personal choices are you don't have to break down everything into its small pieces to try to enjoy it you know I enjoy cake. What a, what a shocker, right? But I don't, I don't need to have someone give me a lecture about what it's made of as I'm eating it. I just want to eat it and enjoy it because it's one of those pleasures I have in life. And that's kind of what Whitman's pointing to here, the idea that, you know, sometimes it's okay just to enjoy things. In fact, and the scientists, the, those of you who want to be any kind of scientist are going to hate me for this, but the fact is that sometimes learning how things are put together really kind of damages you know, the enjoyment of it, you know. Um, my wife and I right now are having a little bit of uh, an issue with, you know, we know it's time to let our, uh, our youngest child know about, the San about Santa Claus. I'm, I'm, I'm doing this video right during Christmas, for those of you who maybe I do this a year later and it's at a different time. But, you know, we were debating that all year about telling him because we know that he's ready. He's definitely old enough. I mean, he's past old enough. Um, but it's one of those things that you, you don't want to rob kids of that excitement because once that little magical piece is removed, you can still enjoy Christmas. I still love it, but something never comes back. And um, that's, you know, the enjoyment of that. It doesn't mean you have to know how the presents get there and all of that. Sometimes it's great just to enjoy the fact that you think that some magical guy comes down 
comes down your chimney, puts tr uh, presents under your tree, like if you've been good, and then leaves, and that's it. And so there's something so interesting and, and beautiful about that that's gone when you explain that no, your parents had to you know go out and uh, spend hard-earned money and put things on a credit card so that you can have these toys. Um, that doesn't have quite the ring to it, you know. So that's what Whitman's dealing with here, the idea that sometimes it's okay just to enjoy things for enjoying them and not know everything about them. Um, you know, I don't disagree. I love this poem. Now, I don't love the way it's written. But, I mean, it's very free verse. It's very simple. You have to do a little bit of thinking on your own. I would say with free verse, it require, maybe requires even more of that. Um, but that's okay. There's nothing wrong with thinking, right? All right, guys, well, we're going to stop here because I do actually have Whitman broken into two sections. Uh, the next section we're going to read by the Bivouac's Fitful Flame, which, hey, I've never even read in my life, so I'm going to tackle that one before. I'm not going to first uh, impression that one because if I have no clue what it is, I look like an idiot. And then we're going to do I Hear America Singing, which is another uh, really powerful uh, poem of Whitman's that he's well known for and that I love. And then we're going to end with A Noiseless Patient Spider, which I've also never read. Because anything that mentions spiders, I tend to avoid. So I'll read that one and have my nightmares early and be ready to discuss that with you. I will post those videos tomorrow. Like I said, I know we're a day behind. This video right now, when filming was supposed to be for Friday, those of you who are at home on quarantine right now may have been wondering where it was. I apologize. We didn't do it in class either. Uh, we had some other issues come up, and I was trying to deal with that. So, um, and you know, this week's going to be a crazy one. So I'm trying to get this out there to you for before the test. Our test is actually going to be Wednesday, don't forget. So it's coming up over all of these. You'll be able to use your notes. You'll be able to use your book. Don't sweat that. All right. Okay, guys. Well, that's the end of today's lesson. And uh, I'll have the next one up probably later today. So those of you who are working at home can study ahead. All right. All right. Well, take care, guys. Have a great uh, well, for me, it's a Monday. I hope uh, you have a great day, whatever day it is for you when you're viewing this.